My name is Ronald Hutton, and I'm a professor of history at Bristol University and a commissioner of English heritage. All my life, I've had a passion for museums, and in this new series, I'm going to take you to a few of my own favorite little hidden gems. So whether it's ancient Egypt, Victorian London, or even human remains that pique your interest, I hope that this cornucopia of curiosities will tickle your fancy as much as it has done mine. Welcome to more of the delights of my favourite hidden museums. Later in the programme, we're going to Lord's Cricket Ground, the heart of the game of cricket, and the MCC museum that's attached. But right now, we're in the leafy streets of Hampstead and about to enter the Freud Museum, the very last home of the father of the science of psychology. The Freud Museum was the home of Sigmund Freud and his family when they escaped the Nazi annexation of Austria in 1938. It remained the family home until Anna Freud, the youngest daughter, died in 1982. The centerpiece of the museum is Freud's study, faithfully preserved just as it was during his lifetime, containing Freud's remarkable collection of ancient antiquities, his library, his desk, and of course his world-famous couch. The museum's curator, Carol Siegel, was kind enough to show me round. OK, shall we go into the study now, which is uh, very much the heart of the house? Oh, the Holy of Holies. Absolutely. And certainly for a lot of our visitors, this is, this is the, 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 the key, this is what people come for. Sigmund Freud's couch, the couch that he saw hundreds of patients on and which came with him from Vienna to oh, his wow. house. <laughs> so this is the original Freudian couch. This is the original Freudian couch. There are plenty of copies, but this is the, this is the real deal. This is the piece of furniture which launched a thousand classic case studies for science. Absolutely. Absolutely. My first reaction is how comfortable it looks. Uh, what actually is the item of furniture beneath? Well, I think it probably looks more comfortable than it is. The item of furniture be beneath is a very plain horsehair filled sofa. Um, it was actually given to Sigmund Freud by a, by a patient back in the 1890s before really he developed the, the, the method of using the couch as a method of treatment. It was, it was just given to him as a present. Um, he has covered it, as you see, with this beautiful carpet, and it's the carpet that gives it sort of magical quality, in a sense. Um, underneath, as I say, sort of plain and um, rather uncomfortable now couch, but I'm not going to let you try it, I'm afraid. It's one of the things that visitors always want to do, is lie on the couch, and unfortunately it's not, an, not something that we can offer any longer. I'm happy not to do so. It looks so luxurious, and this is the kind of magic carpet of free association. This is Sigmund Freud's desk. As you see, he would um, keep many of his pieces from this very large collection the favorite pieces would be on the desk in front of him um, and sort of give him inspiration while he was working and while he was writing one of his favorite pieces is this Athene here and it was actually this piece which his friend Mary Bonaparte who was so influential in helping Sigmund Freud leave Vienna um, actually smuggled out for him um, at the time thinking that he might he might not be able to bring uh, his collection with him and she smuggled out Athene so that that at least would be here in England when he arrived. Did the desk itself come from Vienna? Yes it did um, and the chair the chair is very special as well it was you can see it's a very unusual um, shape and it was designed uh, especially for Sigmund Freud and given to him by his daughter Matilda um, and the um, idea was that apparently he used to like to to sit with his legs over the um, arm of the chair and it was designed to kind of make that possible um, but it's rather like a kind of Henry Moore sculpture in itself I think Sigmund Freud was very interested in news of archaeological digs and he often made the analogy himself between archaeology 
and psychoanalysis, you know, that sort of archaeologists, you know, digging down through layers of earth in order to find the truth was not unlike somebody delving into a person's mind to try and uncover uh, the truth of their existence. So there were quite close links between his collecting and his thinking. Let's have a look over here. I mean, we've talked a little bit about the library, but I think this really just illustrates um, some of Freud's particular passions um, and uh, reading. I mean, this is his collection of works by Goethe, an author he admired hugely, and also Shakespeare, another of his um, favourite authors. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about archaeology and his interest in archaeology, and you can see here, um, you know, the Arthur Evans uh, excavations at uh, Knossos, Schliemann, um, uh, you know, he, he um, Freud used archaeology as a metaphor for psychoanalysis and it's interesting to see some of these key works here in, on the bookshelves. Look at the sheer range of activities represented here, I mean, the whole of human life. Uh, it's id, ego and superego, all represented in three dimensions and fitting in with the human imagination, the bookcase. Yes, and then just as well, the kind of the family man too, you know, pictures of Martha, Sigmund Freud's wife, close friends. Um, I think many people feel when they come into this space, what an extraordinary mix it is of so many ideas, cultures, resonances, um, you know, all contained in a way within, within the life of one person. And also, I feel it's so cosy, it's so welcoming, it's so inhabitable. Mm. It doesn't have that coldness of so many preserved spaces frozen in time mm. and in personality. This place has turned out to be even more of a treasure trove than I expected. It's not just a museum, it's a personal home, bringing us right up into the life of a great man. Sophie, the curator, has helped me choose five objects in particular which take us to the heart of Freud and his life, starting with the menu from his wedding reception in Vienna. It was a four-year courtship because, like most scholars, he was broke when young and so couldn't afford to marry his beloved. But he did, and there they are together. This is actually a napkin ring from the reception. Uh, the menu is very homespun. This is classic Viennese middle-class stuff, starting with soup, going on to beefsteak. Next, sign of that happy marriage is his wallet, which has a lock of his wife's hair forever enclosed within it. That devotion brings me right to the centre of Freud's capacity for love. And over here, his notebook from his time living here in London. The list on the right-hand page is actually one of his visitors here. And they include people like Salvador Dali, who's halfway down, and Melanie Klein, just a couple above there. And finally, in front of me here, are some of the most intimate objects his last pair of spectacles, so you can actually see how the man himself literally viewed the world through eyes which taught us to look at the world in a totally different sort of way. And finally, most poignant of all perhaps, is his pill box. I hadn't realised till I came here that for 16 years he suffered from tongue cancers and mouth cancers and these were constantly operated upon. He had no less than 30 different operations. A lot of his trouble almost certainly due to his addiction to nicotine, so he was a man who admitted he had addictions, uh, one to nicotine, one to collecting, and he couldn't break any of them. So this very, very human side of a person who knew he was damaging himself physically in a very profound way, but couldn't quite give it up, and the pillbox a poignant reminder of the sheer physical torment through which he went for almost two decades in which he helped other people to get out of their emotional torment. It's all here. There were three giants that made the modern world, Marx, Freud and Einstein. 
and one third of that making of modernity is around me and in front of me now. It's a remarkable experience. It's not a large museum. In fact, it's really just a modest North London home. But for me, it's all the more poignant for being just that. It's a huge thrill to be able to see Freud's actual desk, his glasses, his papers, and of course the famous couch. It's very easy to imagine the great man in this house, enjoying his freedom, surrounded by his family and friends in the last year of his life. Lords is of course the most famous cricket ground in the world, but it's also home to the MCC Museum, which is the oldest sports museum in the world, containing the most celebrated collection of cricket memorabilia, including the infamous Ashes Urn. The Marylebone Cricket Club, or the MCC as it's known, has been collecting memorabilia since 1864, and the items on display include cricket kit used by legends of the crease, old scorecards, and lots of trophies. Neil Robinson is the museum's curator. Well, Ronald, as you can see, we've got a, a wide variety of memorabilia here from standard cricket equipment such as bats, caps, boots, to magazines, even a cigar box presented to Douglas Jardine by his grateful team at the end of the Body Line Tour in 1932-33. And a story attached to every exhibit. Exactly. Ev every exhibit here tells a story. We've, we've broken them up into thematic categories. So here we have a cabinet dedicated to race. And this is a very interesting item here. It's, a, it's an Aboriginal war club. You may not be aware that the first Australian team ever to tour the UK was actually a team of Aboriginals in 1868. Is that them? That is the very team just before they travelled out to the UK. And as part of the entertainment on the days when they played their matches, they were put on displays of athleticism and sports, one of which involved this club, which is known as a Nulla Nulla, um, being used by one of the cricketers to defend himself when he was pelted with cricket balls. He was very deft at using it and was only recorded to have been hit twice during the entire tour. I can see the abrasions made by the balls Indeed. on the side of the club. Indeed. It's, oh, uh, it's a very remarkable item. The collection houses thousands of items, but there are some obvious highlights. We have a lovely bat that was used by Len Hutton to make his, his fabulous score of 364 in the Oval Test in 1938 against the Australians. And that's been illustrated with a cartoon on the back of the bat showing the wicketkeeper having grown an extremely long beard while the innings was being compiled. But perhaps the, the greatest artefact here of all would have to be the Ashes Urn, which has been here since 1928. It's never been a trophy, but it is the iconic representation of Anglo-Australian cricket and a memorial of a, an unusual time when it was strange for Australia to beat England on the cricket field. I must admit that I've never been much of a cricket fan. So I was pleasantly surprised to find that the MCC Museum is home to a rare collection of curiosities, which would tickle the fancy of even a hardened cricket phobe. ...to see the various different styles of the different artists we'd used. Well, here we are, Ronald. Here is the, the Holy of Holies. We're going in now to see the Ashes Urn. It feels exactly like entering a shrine. It is a little bit like that, I must say. Oh, my goodness. Well, after you, Thank I'll you. let you lead the way. It's tiny. It is very, very small indeed. It's four and a half inches without its base. Um, and it looks like a religious relic in a cathedral. Indeed. It's even slightly tilted like the Leaning Tower of Pisa. What is in it? Do we have any idea? We really don't know. There is the story that a bale was burned in that social match in 1882-83 at Rupert's Wood House and placed within the urn. There's no proof of that. It's simply the most likely of many theories. We were due to take it on tour to Australia in the early 2000s. And as part of the conservation assessment we did, we'd ha we had it x-rayed. And that revealed a number of tiny little cracks in the terracotta that, that it's made up from. Um, and there were signs of previous repair showing that it, it had at some point been broken and put back together. Now, there is a story that when the urn was kept at the home of Lord Darnley, Cobham Hall down in Kent, 
a overzealous maid was dusting it. It was kept on the family mantelpiece and it was dusted off the shelf and shattered on the floor. Now, obviously, it has been broken at some point. We really don't know whether the contents that there are in now, and from the x-ray we know that there is something in the base there. We don't know if that's what was originally put in there in 1882. And quite frankly, although we probably could find out by chemical analysis, we'd prefer to keep the mystique going. I entirely understand. And speaking of mystique, it seems extraordinary that so much emotion, so much passion, so much energy, so much sweat, so much fear, so much hope should be invested in something that plain and that tiny. It might not look like much, but this little urn is one of the most iconic sporting trophies of all time. It's a vivid reminder of the turbulent history between England and its former Antipodean prison colony turned sports mad nation. So right through the museum we have uh, an amazing range of objects, but coming up here we have one of the real curiosities that you might not expect to find in a cricket museum. This is a sparrow that was killed in flight while flying across the pitch in a match between Cambridge University and MCC in 1936. The bowler, Jahangir Khan, was bowling at the time and the ball went straight down the wicket and uh, killed the sparrow instantly. My goodness, that is what I call fast bowling. Mm. I believe the umpire called dead ball, perhaps dead sparrow, should have been the more appropriate <laughs> signal. Well, it's kind of quits, isn't it? It is, really. Even if you're not an Arden cricket fan, there's much here to entertain and amuse you including a copy of the cricketer's Bible, Wisdom, that helped to sustain E.W. Swanton through his captivity in a Japanese prisoner of war camp during World War II. Well, Ronald, we've got a few items here on the table that I thought it'd be nice to show you. Um, perhaps we'll start with this boot over here. Um, this is a boot that was presented to us by Sir Donald Bradman, the famous Australian cricketer, at the very end of his test career in 1948. Uh, Bradman was renowned as the greatest batsman ever to have played the game. He very nearly averaged 100 in test matches, and the rest of the, the best of the, uh, the historical batsmen have never really averaged more than the 60s. So he was the chap whom the English uh, fast bowlers uh, used as a kind of cricket stall or coconut shy. Exactly. On the Bodyline Tour of 1932-33, Donald Bradman had such a reputation that the English knew they had to, to break him or they wouldn't be able to win the series. So they came up with the, the Bodyline tactics, bowling down the line of the body, which the Australians called unsportsmanlike and caused a, a huge diplomatic row between the two countries, not just between the two cricket boards. So this, this is a, a remarkable item um, relating to one of the, the most famous and important cricketers in, in the history of the game. Thank you. What's next? This is a bat used by Geoffrey Boycott, the famous Yorkshire and England cricketer, um, to play his famous innings in the Gillette Cup final of 1965. Now, Boycott was a famously slow scorer, and there was a story that at the start of this innings, which was a one-day match, so quick scoring was important, um, Brian Close, the Yorkshire captain, came to Boycott and said, if you don't start scoring some runs more quickly, I'm going to run you out. <sighs> Boycott suddenly did start scoring runs, most uncharacteristically hit three sixes and ended up with a score of 146, winning Yorkshire the match and himself the Man of the Match award. That's I marvelous. think you perhaps should handle that. I, I do feel privileged to hold this and uh, to see the signature and to know the name and Indeed. I remember the occasion being Indeed. within my lifetime. Glorious, thank you very much. Now, perhaps the most famous cricketer of, of all time, unless you're an Australian and vote for Bradman, would be W.G. Grace. Um, this cap was worn by W.G. Grace on Lord Sheffield's tour of Australia in 1891-92. Grace was a, a professional doctor, but an amateur cricketer. Oh. Um, although he was technically an amateur, he still earned a lot more from playing cricket than most professionals ever did. His fee for this tour was £3,000 plus free passage and accommodation for his wife, and a locum to look after his medical practice in Bristol while he was overseas. And that's late 19th century? That's 1891, yes. My 3, goodness. £3,000, an awful lot of money in those days. It shows how far cricket had come by that Indeed, time. indeed. Well, that's the kind of amateurism I, with which I could live. <laughs> it was often known as shamateurism, for reasons <laughs> which I think I are see pretty that. obvious.
One is easily reminded at the MCC Museum of just how large an influence cricket has had on this nation. It really is woven into the very fabric of British and colonial history. It has often been said that we created an empire with a Lee Enfield rifle and a cricket bat, and that's self-evident here. When you see the game's influence in India, in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and even Canada. What a remarkable day. Two museums, less than a mile apart in northwest London. One dedicated to a great man, the other to a great sport. And yet, maybe there's a connection between them. Because Freud was the discoverer of the modern mind, and cricket is the thinking person's game. See you later. Goodbye for now. Back off the beaten tourist track again next Wednesday night. Great British interiors kick off another brand new double bill of Professor Hutton's Curiosities at Nine only on yesterday. We're next tonight, Time Team. in helping Sigmund Freud leave Vienna um, actually smuggled out for him um, at the time thinking that he might he might not be able to bring uh, his collection with him and she smuggled out Athene so that that at least would be here in England when he arrived. Did the desk itself come from Vienna? Yes it did um, and the chair the chair is very special as well it was you can see it's a very unusual um, shape and it was designed uh, especially for Sigmund Freud and given to him by his daughter Matilda um, and the um, idea was that apparently he used to like to to sit with his legs over the um, arm of the chair and it was designed to kind of make that possible um, but it's rather like a kind of Henry Moore sculpture in itself I think Sigmund Freud was very interested in news of archaeological digs and he often made the analogy himself between him as a present. Um, he has covered it, as you see, with this beautiful carpet and it's the carpet that gives it sort of magical quality in a sense. Um, underneath there's a sort of plain and um, rather uncomfortable now couch but I'm not going to let you try it I'm afraid it's one of the things that visitors always want to do is lie on the couch and unfortunately it's not an, not something that we can offer any longer I'm happy not to do so it looks so luxurious and this is the kind of magic carpet of free association this is Sigmund Freud's desk as you see he would um, keep many of his pieces from this very large collection. The favourite pieces would be on the desk in front of him um, and sort of give him inspiration while he was working and while he was writing. One of his favourite pieces is this Athene here and it was actually this piece which his friend Mary Bonaparte, who was so influential. To more of the delights of my favourite hidden museums. Later in the programme, we're going to Lord's Cricket Ground, the heart of the game of cricket, and the MCC museum that's attached. But right now, we're in the leafy streets of Hampstead and about to enter the Freud Museum, the very last home of the father of the science of psychology. The Freud Museum was the home of Sigmund Freud and his family when they escaped the Nazi annexation of Austria in 1938. It remained the family home until Anna Freud, the youngest daughter, died in 1982. The centerpiece of the museum is Freud's study, faithfully preserved just as it was during his lifetime, containing Freud's remarkable collection of ancient antiquities, his library, his desk, and of course his world-famous couch. The museum's curator, Carol Siegel, was kind enough to show me round. OK, shall we go into the study now, which is uh, very much the heart of the house? Oh, the Holy of Holies. Absolutely. And certainly for a lot of our visitors, this is, this is the, 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 the key, this is what people come for. Sigmund Freud's couch, the couch that he saw 
hundreds of patients on and which came with him from Vienna to oh, his wow. house. Oh, wow. So this is the <laughs> original Freudian couch. This is the original Freudian couch. There are plenty of copies, but this is the, this is the real deal. This is the piece of furniture which launched a thousand classic case studies for science. Absolutely. Absolutely. My first reaction is how comfortable it looks. Uh, what actually is the item of furniture beneath? Well, I think it probably looks more comfortable than it is. The item of furniture be beneath is a very plain horsehair filled sofa. Um, it was actually given to Sigmund Freud by a, by a patient back in the 1890s before really he developed the, the, the method of using the couch as a method of treatment. It was, it was just given to him. My name is Ronald Hutton, and I'm a professor of history at Bristol University and a commissioner of English heritage. All my life I've had a passion for museums, and in this new series I'm going to take you to a few of my own favourite little hidden gems. So whether it's ancient Egypt, Victorian London, or even human remains that pique your interest, I hope that this cornucopia of curiosities will tickle your fancy as much as it has done mine. Welcome to the original <laughs> Freudian couch. This is the original Freudian couch. There are plenty of copies, but this is the, this is the real deal. This is the piece of furniture which launched a thousand classic case studies for science. Absolutely. Absolutely. My first reaction is how comfortable it looks. Uh, what actually is the item of furniture beneath? Well, I think it probably looks more comfortable than it is. The item of furniture be beneath is a very plain horsehair filled sofa. Um, it was actually given to Sigmund Freud by a, by a patient back in the 1890s before really he developed the, the, the method of using the couch as a method of treatment. It was, it was just given to him as a present. Um, he has covered it, as you see, with this beautiful carpet and it's the carpet that gives it sort of magical quality in a sense. Um, underneath there's a sort of plain and um, rather uncomfortable now couch but I'm not going to let you try it I'm afraid. It's one of the things that visitors always want to do is lie on the couch and unfortunately it's not, an, not something that we can offer any longer. I'm happy not to do so. It looks so luxurious and this is the kind of magic carpet of free association. This is Sigmund Freud's desk. As you see, he would um, keep many of his pieces from this very large collection. The favourite pieces would be on the desk in front of him um, and sort of give him inspiration while he was working and while he was writing. One of his favourite pieces is this Athene here, and it was actually this piece which his friend Mary Bonaparte. Than human remains that pique your interest. I hope that this cornucopia of curiosities will tickle your fancy as much as it has done mine. Welcome to more of the delights of my favourite hidden museums. Later in the programme, we're going to Lord's Cricket Ground, the heart of the game of cricket, and the MCC museum that's attached. But right now, we're in the leafy streets of Hampstead, and about to enter the Freud Museum, the very last home of the father of the science of psychology. The Freud Museum was the home of Sigmund Freud and his family when they escaped the Nazi annexation of Austria in 1938. It remained the family.
My name is Ronald Hutton, and I'm a professor of history at Bristol University and a commissioner of English heritage. All my life I've had a passion for museums, and in this new series I'm going to take you to a few of my own favourite little hidden gems. So whether it's ancient Egypt, Victorian London, or even home until Anna Freud, the youngest daughter, died in 1982, the centrepiece of the museum is Freud's study, faithfully preserved just as it was during his lifetime, containing Freud's remarkable collection of ancient antiquities, his library, his desk, and of course his world-famous couch. The museum's curator, Carol Siegel, was kind enough to show me round. OK, shall we go into the study now, which is uh, very much the heart of the house? Oh, the Holy of Holies. Absolutely. And certainly for a lot of our visitors, this is, this is the, 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 the key, this is what people come for, Sigmund Freud's couch, the couch that he saw hundreds of patients on and which came with him from Vienna to oh, this wow. house. Oh, wow. So this is the 